welcome to my study. Thanks for clicking on this video and joining us this morning. Uh, if you're new here, my name is Chris, and in these Wednesday videos, I uh, invite you into the things that I have been thinking about. Uh, we wonder and discuss together uh, what it means to be Christian in the 21st century by thinking theologically and liturgically about life and faith. I haven't done this yet uh, in these videos, but uh, I want to pick up on an idea that uh, I kind of introduced in my Sunday sermon, um, but the, the pressing into it sort of landed on the cutting room floor as I was preparing for that. Uh, and so this is kind of a, a follow-up conversation to that, maybe a little bit uh, diving a little bit deeper into that. And so if you like, you can check uh, on our YouTube channel for that service and visit that uh, before listening to this, um, or you can listen to this and see where the conversation goes. But on Sunday, I made mention of uh, a study that was published in 2018 by Rick Heemstra and a few other sociologists here in Canada. And they interviewed Christian young people uh, to get an assessment of their uh, spiritual selves, of their religious identity. Uh, and a number of these individuals who were professing to be Christian. Uh, and in summary to all of that, that study, which was uh, published under the title of Renegotiating Faith, as they, they summarized that, they landed on this sort of um, religious doctrine, or they summarized the, the religious sense of a number of the people they interviewed under the term U-G-R-E, or um, I call it ogre, um, although it's not actually ogre, but and that stands for Universal Gnostic Religious Ethic. The general idea there is that the people whom they interviewed uh, largely understood religion or faith and practice there uh, in universal uh, senses of a special knowledge that had a religious ethic or a moral characteristic to it that applied to everyone across the board. Um, but it was not necessarily what you and I might call traditional or biblical Christianity. In that, they outlined uh, five sort of core values to UGRE, uh, and two of those have to do with this idea of social tolerance. Social tolerance uh, emerges as a core spiritual value, uh, as a core societal value, as one of the most important uh, commitments and aspects of living life together. In fact, the tenet of belief uh, that they uh, discerned there was that good humans practice social tolerance. Now, the reason why I want to pick up on that um, is because this way of thinking influences us in life and faith together. And in some senses, this is just the water we swim in, this is just the air we breathe, and so we might not even be aware of how uh, deeply ingrained or um, how pervasive this way of being in the world has become for many of us. And I want us to uh, spend some time here thinking critically about what that might mean or what that might look like. And here's where it connects to the rest of what I had mentioned on Sunday in our series on James called Hearers and Doers, where we sort of looked at the under the banner and theme of make it real, making our faith real by living compelling lives in the world. And the language that I didn't use on Sunday, but uh, had used it sort of in my own preparation, was that our orthodoxy necessarily informs or necessarily shapes or determines our orthopraxy. And what I mean, what I mean by that is that our right doctrines, our right thinking, necessarily connects to the, our right doing and our right living. So the ideas that we have about life, the theological doctrines that we hold, must connect, must be made real in the things that we do, in the good that we practice. And why do I think that that's important? Because as this value of social tolerance makes its way into uh, the air we breathe or the, the ideological norm in our culture today, what ends up happening is we create a dichotomy between a theological and biblical orthodoxy and loving 
behavior. Right? We make doctrine and practice separate things. Now, here's some of the ways we might do that. Right? We uh, sometimes do this as Christians, and we, we use the biblical language here, right? Of saying things like, yeah, you know, I uh, prefer grace over truth, or we need more grace in this moment and not all the truth, right? We think uh, and talk about being, um, having love and being merciful and doing that and desiring that more than being right. But I think that this is potentially maybe even probably, uh, just a way that the UGRE value of social tolerance is working its way into professing Christian thinking. Right? We lean towards grace, we might say, or we value truth. Or the way that it works is generally actually is when we're talking about other people or about other communities or traditions or the like. And we say things like, you know, they are more interested in truth than they are in grace. Or we say things like, uh, they're more concerned with being inclusive and loving than they are with having any standard of truth. Right? It, it, to be honest, we sort of mean that in a slanderous way, but what we are doing there right, is presuming that there's a conflict or a dichotomy between grace and truth. Problem is, of course, right, that uh, in the Bible, in Jesus, and in the character of God, grace and truth are not at odds. John 1, verse 14, one of my favorite texts in all of the Bible, right, said, And the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who comes from the Father, full of grace and truth. Right? He comes full of grace and truth. Not grace and or truth, or sometimes grace and sometimes truth, but he is full of grace and truth. Right? And we see that manifested in the person and ministry of Jesus, right? In places like John 4 with the Samaritan woman at the well, right? The grace of Jesus draws this woman towards the truth about herself and her sin, and towards the truth about who Jesus is as the true Messiah. Likewise, John 8, you see this, and the, the story about the woman who's caught into adultery, and a crowd of people bring her towards Jesus, and they ask Jesus, what should we do? And Jesus says, let the one who is without sin cast the first stone. And then when nobody casts a stone, Jesus says, who is left to condemn you? And she says, no one. And Jesus says, then neither do I condemn you. Right? Grace upon grace, if there ever, is, ever, ever was a moment of that for her in her life. And yet, Jesus immediately follows that up by saying, go and leave your life of sin. Right? The truth that there are certain behaviors and ways of living in the world that are just not congruent with what it means to be human and what it means to be a follower of Jesus, more importantly. In fact, it's not loving, nor is it properly inclusive to accept or encourage or to tolerate what the Bible calls sin. Right? Or even to accept or uh, encourage or to tolerate what the Bible calls unwise behavior or foolish thinking. In fact, there's so many texts that we could uh, go to to make this point and underscore this point and to see the connection more clearly between grace and truth. I do just want to highlight one or two of them for you. So first of all, 1 Corinthians 13, right, which is this famous chapter on love. Paul writes there, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. And so there's a contrast there, right, between first love and evil, but also evil and truth, and love rejoicing with the truth coming together. Right? Likewise, uh, 1 Peter 1 verse 22 says, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, 
love one another deeply from the heart. And what's Peter's point, right, is that the truth has uh, had the effect of changing the way they see the world, the way they think, and the way they uh, know they ought to operate in the world, uh, and then says to love one another. So that truth reframing our perspective on life uh, impacts how we love one another. Or to put it the way I had at the beginning, our orthodoxy informs our orthopraxy, and we work that out in community, just like we are worked upon by God and the saints in community. And also uh, in Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4, Paul writes, Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, Speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. Aligning our orthodoxy and our orthopraxy is the path of devotion and discipline and faith formation for the believer. It is the journey we are on in taking every thought captive to Christ. It is the journey we are on being transformed into the image of the Son. It is the journey of letting the truth of who God is and what he has done in the world, the truth of his revelation, his scriptures to us, his spoken word to us, shape us to be loving and gracious and merciful in the world. Now let me be really clear, and maybe this is an important uh, word of caution or introspection for you. Because, like Paul, I want to be careful who we apply this way of thinking and this way of being to. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, 12, For what do I have to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? And so let me be clear, this standard, this uh, high bar of holiness for those of us in the church that is shaped by our uh, thinking, our theological reflection, and our uh, devotion in God's word is for Christians. I'm not worried about people who do not profess to be Christians thinking this way or believing this way uh, and connecting their um, certain moralities and attitudes. Primarily, I am concerned with Christians, with people who profess to be Christian, so that we as Christians might not presume or live out of that false dichotomy between grace and truth that we might let our doctrine inform our praxis, that we might live the way that God has called us to live, designed us to live, and remade us to live, that we might live in the power of the Holy Spirit as he equips us to live for that. And so as we go forward and as you spend some time reflecting on this, I want you to think in your own life and in your own way, how has this value of social tolerance, this uh, operating out of a, a dichotomy between grace and truth manifest itself in you or in your walk. Maybe you have said something like, I'm more concerned with being encouraging or being inclusive than I am with being right. But as we've seen, that's a false comparison. Right? As Christians, we are required to think biblically. We are required to believe biblically, and we are required to behave biblically. And as Christians, we can and should expect that other professing Christians do the same. And that's love and grace, truth and mercy, all wrapped into one. Maybe you've said something in the past like, you know, I don't believe theology is important, just give me something to do. But again, you will do or not do what you believe to be important. 
right? And you will give your life to what you believe uh, is important. And what you believe, right, is your system of belief. It is your theology. It is doctrine. It is the truth that you operate out of in the world. And again, there's a straight line between what you believe is right and the right things that you do. Finally, right, there's another way or the other side of this. Um, because the reality is, right, uh, theology, um, doctrine without love, or without grace, is a resounding gong, to use the language of Paul. And to be honest, theology without grace, pardon me, can make you a bit of an ass. And yes, God can speak through an ass. He's done it in the past. Just ask Balaam about it. But it's better for you, and it's better for me, if he doesn't have to. Thank you very much for checking us out and for thinking about life and faith with us. I encourage you to uh, keep on thinking. I pass the question off to you. Uh, once again, God bless. Have a good week and keep on studying.